Hi, I'm Patricia Allian. I'd like to give you an introduction to the Kemet School's in-depth study of the Gosford Glyphs located in Australia. Uh, the first time Yosef and I viewed the Gosford Glyphs, we saw them as posts on our Facebook group page about two and a half years ago. Although it was obvious they were made to look like Egyptian hieroglyphs, we couldn't help but question their authenticity. It wasn't long after that that our friend Sonia Van Gelder from Australia contacted us to tell us that she was working with a team called the Forgotten Origins Team with Steve and Evan Strong, who was investigating the Gosford Glyph site. She asked if we could help them with the interpretation for the glyphs. After a quick glance and giving us a few short translations, Joseph remarked that it would take a great deal of in-depth research to give them the attention they deserved. This past January, when Beatrice Awian and I were planning a lecture tour in Australia, Sonia and Evan invited us to come and explore the Gosford site for ourselves. It was a wonderful adventure, and we were blessed to meet and be led by some of the local original elders, who gifted us with much background information about the site that was also known to be a powerful sacred area for women. We were especially taken with the custodial elder of the woman's lore of this area, who has sadly has recently passed, and out of respect, I won't speak her name. She shared many stories with us that evening, including what the ancestors had told her about the Egyptians who had visited this area in ancient times. We showed her a short video that the Kemet School created with a brief interpretation of what we all felt were authentic hieroglyphs. She was very excited and grateful and said that Yosef and Muhammad's interpretation was completely in line with the knowledge she had been given. We made a promise to her that we would make a much more in-depth presentation when we returned to Egypt in order to help her and the many other original people of the area in their efforts to save and protect this site for future generations and to honor the connection between these two ancient civilizations. When we were taken to the site, I was immediately impacted by the energy of the area and by the energy of the glyphs themselves. In that moment, I felt that they were indeed authentic and had an amazing story to tell. Beatrice, as one of the Kemet team's photographers, was able to take many pictures of the hieroglyphs for us to bring back to Yosef and Muhammad for an intense examination. I would like to note that both Beatrice and I had powerful experiences at the Gosford site that will never be forgotten. And now it's time to introduce Yosef and Muhammad. Yosef Awian, my husband and son of Abdel Hakim Awian, has been studying hieroglyph, hieroglyph symbolism and the mysteries of the ancient Egyptian civilization for most of his life. Muhammad Ibrahim is a licensed tour guide with over 15 years experience in the field. He has a bachelor's degree in ancient Egyptian civilization studies, including Egyptian hieroglyphs, and he is a teacher of hieroglyphs. Okay, let's get started. I think we need to address the question, did the ancient Egyptians have the capability of traveling overseas? Yes, sure. The evidences we uh, can find from the ancient Egyptian uh, stories and pictures left on the sites and on the uh, Egyptian tombs and from small or big objects showing that the ship industry, ship's industry was very uh, popular during the ancient Egyptian times starting from what we call it the pre-dynastic time and this is uh, one of the pictures we can see this is a kind of jar pottery jar from uh, what we call it pre-dynastic time according to Egyptologists this is around uh, or before 3300 BC and we can see the Egyptians had made drawings of a boat maybe it's not a huge but the idea of having boats and ships existed from the time and by the beginning of the Egyptian time according to Egyptologists also 3300 BC what we call it Old Kingdom, New Kingdom the, they developed doing ships like the ship uh, the famous one we have the solar boat of King Cheops this is the solar boat uh, of King Khufu the one found behind the Great Pyramid this is the best boat we have and the biggest was ever found in Egypt and from the ancient world. This boat is 43.6 uh, 43 meters long and according to the uh, statistics we have that this is maybe longer more than uh, more, uh, longer twice more than the, uh, the three boats uh, Christopher Columbus used to explore America. Okay. The longest ship Christopher Columbus used was around 17 meters. So this shows that the ancient Egyptians 
were able to do big boats and also uh, they were able to sail in the, uh, in the uh, Red Sea and I believe in the Indian Ocean. What are the proof for this? The famous story about Queen Hatshepsut and her famous expedition to Bont land. Some Egyptologists, they say that Bont land may be Somalia or Ethiopia or maybe another African country in the southern part of Africa. But no way can be like Sudan or uh, Djibouti. You know, it was a far uh, country from Egypt. And the pictures of such boats are depicted on the uh, El Deir al-Bahari temple of Hatshepsut in the West Bank in Luxor. And this is a clear evidence that the ancient Egyptians, they traveled overseas and they had the ability and the capability for uh, such trips. Another evidence is we can read from stories. Maybe it is not strong evidence like Hatshepsut, but still uh, a kind of uh, clear information, like we have the, the famous story of the what we call it the shipwrecked sailor, that they were going to mines, to the royal mines outside of Egypt, because if they were going to Egyptian mines, they would use uh, their foot to go uh, on foot through the desert, or they will use the uh, Feluka boats or the Nile boats if the place is existed in Egypt, like in Aswan or the northwest of Egypt. But they mentioned that uh, they used the, the harbor on the Red Sea and they used boats uh, or ships going to there. And you must know that the ancient Egyptians made differences between the, board, the word boat and the word ship. So the word boat is, is familiar uh, to be used in the night, but the word ship is made especially for the sea. Okay. So he said he faced uh, some strange phenomena, and uh, the, uh, the waves and the winds sent him to an island. And if we say an island, he can live on the island, and he felt strange in that island. If it is an island on the Nile, there is no need to uh, continue the story because he will be in Egypt. He will not feel lost in Egypt. But he said he felt lost and he found a snake. And then he told him that other ships will come within a week to take you back to your country or to your land. So we understand that the ancient Egyptians didn't only uh, sail or go uh, travel overseas, but that is was common. Such trips were uh, happening I think monthly or uh, with a certain schedule. You've convinced me that mm -hmm. we, we that the ancient Egyptians could uh, travel by sea and probably did, but mm -hmm. during what time periods? Um, okay, so uh, if we follow the Egyptian stories, we have a story of Bibi II, one of the kings of the sixth dynasty, and the story is saying that he sent an expedition to Central Africa. So this is, in my opinion, the. Uh, uh, the oldest date uh, as a strong story or a strong evidence. The oldest date we can uh, use. That we find for documented, mm -hmm. but there's no reason not to believe that possibly exactly. they had been traveling. According to other evidences, but maybe not very strong, like the written things, mm -hmm. because you know our mentality now are using or depending on written uh, information. So according to written information, it will be maybe the second, it's around uh, 2300 BC. But other sources are giving us the, uh, the story that the ancient Egyptians used to travel maybe before the dynasty's time, uh, before 3500 BC. And uh, in the end of the lecture, I will show you some of the uh, such evidences. Fantastic. So, as I was explaining that, Yusuf brought us some pictures showing uh, the Egyptian ships sailing in a different environment from Egypt, from the Nile. Because the kind of sea life we can see, that is not the same uh, fish, kind of fish or sea uh, animals like we can see. like a squid. <laughs> we can see a squid, yes, we can see a lobster. Yes. Okay. That is all existed in the Red Sea or the Indian Ocean. And we can understand from this picture that the ancient Egyptians, if they traveled once or twice or three times, they may not recognize such creatures. But because they recognized them and they managed to draw them in this perfection, it means that they, they traveled for 
hundreds, maybe thousands of times. And these depictions were found on um, going back to Old Kingdom tombs and mortuary temples? These depictions temples? from the, uh, uh, no, the, the Old Kingdom, they depicted the Nile uh, okay. life, but those depictions existed in Hatshepsut temple from uh, the, the famous story again, Bond okay. expedition. 18th dynasty. It, yeah, uh, from the New Kingdom time, 18th dynasty. Okay. okay. So they're not just sailing. Yeah, also so uh, as we explained, so it, it wasn't also, if we read the story of uh, Hatshepsut carefully, it wasn't one ship sailing. It was a fleet sailing to Bonk land. And we could count four boats, huge boats. Uh, how we say huge, what is the reason or the scale we can say huge or no. If we look to the picture, we can see they loaded the, the, uh, the ship was lots of uh, goats and lots of trees. If we have a small boat or a small ship, it will be impossible to load uh, to load so many trees in the ship. Okay, and it will be difficult for the the reason why they traveled to Bondland if they will not bring so much uh, things from there. Also, another evidence I use about the capability of sailing on the uh, uh, sailing overseas that by the end of the New Kingdom time, we have two famous names for Egyptian rulers of Pharaohs, Merin Bitah, son of Ramses II, and Ramses III, King Merin Bitah and King Ramses III. There are famous stories for the two, uh, the two kings that they engaged in navy battles with what we call them the sea people. We think the sea people are the southern of Europe, when they are, uh, uh, they ran out of sources. They uh, found that invading the African coast will be a kind of uh, uh, renewing their sources for uh, living. So they attacked the uh, African coast. Uh, African coast, uh, of course, Egypt was the richest country at the time. So they attacked Egypt twice during the uh, time of King Merenbetah and during the time of King Ramses the, the third. According to the evidences we have and the stories of Egyptologists, that is the time of uh, Merin I, that is the first battle we have in the sea, which is not making any sense to me because we defeated the fleet of the sea people completely. It was a great victory. So if we are fighting, if we are, if we are using the sea for the first time, how come we defeat those uh, people with lots of experience. We understand that south of, uh, of Europe, uh, they used to trade with each other, and we have the famous stories about the Vikings, trading with uh, Tunisia, uh, trading with uh, Lebanon, ancient uh, Phoenicia. So they were, uh, they had the capability traveling and fighting in the sea. So if the Egyptians started this for the first time, it would be uh, a great failure and it will be, uh, the army will be defeated. But uh, destroying the fleet and having full control on their Navy soldiers, which it's happened, and we understand that the, the Egyptian king sent or uh, uh, reshaped the, the, the shape of the uh, southern of the Mediterranean, south of Mediterranean, the islands, like he sent what we call them the blast people to Palestine, the, uh, even the name of South Italy was mentioned, Sardinia, as Sirdi. Crete Island was mentioned as a part from those people who attacked Egypt. And the same story repeated during the time of King Ramses III. So that is clear evidence that the ancient Egyptians were very capable, uh, capable to yes. uh, navigating. Yes. And, yes. and of course, we don't forget the, uh, the, the, the harbors we found on the Red Sea and in Alexandria which is called Abu Kir, uh, the modern name, we found an ancient harbor there. Both on the Red Sea and on and the, Mediterranean, the Mediterranean, and they're yes. excavating both sites right now. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yes. This is the picture depicted on the, uh, on the temple of Ramses III, Medina Tehabu, in the West Bank in Luxor, showing the Egyptian fleet fighting with the sea people. And you can see they made their soldiers and their boats in a great shape. If we uh, look to the left side of the picture, we can see the Egyptian uh, soldier standing and shooting an arrow 
it means that the, the boat or the ship had the great palance enabled them to use arrows in that uh, great skill. So back to the story of Cheops. Cheops uh, used to import cedar wood from Lebanon. And it, it is impossible to think or to imagine that they used to bring cedar wood on foot or in the back of the, of the camels or donkeys. No, it was mentioned as uh, the imported cedar wood through the Mediterranean, through the sea. And that is, was one of the famous locations to import cedar wood. Yes. Not to mention also uh, that there is a, a very famous canal known as Cisustris uh, Canal, which was um, uh, uh, digged to connect between the River Nile and the Red Sea. And this way, you can connect actually both the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea through the River Nile. By uh, crossing from this canal to the Red Sea, you can sail from the Red Sea to the Indian Ocean. And, and the other way that you can uh, sail also come from the Red Sea and um, use the same canal and get to the River Nile and then sail exactly. to the Mediterranean How, Sea. What is this dated? This is the, as Yusuf explained, yes, this is, was uh, the first idea was in direct link between the Mediterranean and the Suez Canal and the, uh, the Red Sea mm -hmm. and was replaced in modern time with Suez Canal. So this canal Wait, was, okay. was, you, was made by Senesert III from the Middle Kingdom of the Egyptian history around uh, 1500 BC. You say used by, does that mean it might uh, made, have been made built? By. Oh, made could, by. Made by. Or, or used by. It could have been older, yes. been older. Be. okay. And that canal was lasted till the uh, beginning of the Arabs' time in Egypt, but then it was neglected. Okay. So the idea of having ships, again we repeat this information, started from the beginning of the Egyptian civilization, maybe before, till the end. And if you visit Saqqara tombs, you can, you can see by your own eyes, uh, they represent ships in, in every tomb from uh, Saqqara tombs. And we are not talking about a small boat. If we can count, if we, we can realize how big is the ship, and we can count around 20 persons with 20 oars in this side, in the left side. Yeah. It could be the same on the other side, mm -hmm. on the right side. And we can also recognize how big are the sails. So such kind of sails are sailing on the sea, not in the river Nile. And this is the old kingdom tomb of Meruka? Exactly. Yes. Okay. This is one of the tombs of Saqqara for Meruka mm -hmm. from the 6th dynasty. Wonderful. Well, I know you both have a wealth much more material available, but you've done a wonderful job of showing that they ob obviously did have the capability to travel the, the seven seas. Mm -hmm. So now, I think an important question would be, do you think that the Gosford glyphs represent Egyptian hieroglyphs? Yes, definitely. From the first sight, from the first look, I feel it, uh, I... And you must know that uh, when we made our researches, uh, me and Yusuf, we made it separately in the beginning. He did it by himself and then me too. And then when we met, we found that uh, both of us reached the same result yeah. without contacting each other for more than two weeks. So yes, definitely it is ancient Egyptian writings. No doubt, no doubt about it. These are ancient Egyptian writings. And as Muhammad is gonna show for you now and explain for you also how professional identifies the symbols. Okay, uh, first uh, let's give you an idea about uh, what we call it uh, the code of the Egyptian, uh, ancient Egyptian letters. If we uh, look to what we call it Alan Gardiner sign list of the ancient Egyptian signs, we will see that he classified the Egyptian signs to uh, certain groups. Like the first group we can see, they made the, uh, the man and the relative pictures and the different actions for a man. Like you can see a man standing, stretching his hands, putting his hand in his mouth, fighting, kneeling, praying, old man, young man, drowning, standing, sitting. And he gave the, the, uh, that group the letter A. And each symbol in this group had a number. So if I say A1, it means I'm talking about this symbol, the first symbol, A2, about that certain symbol. So no chances for mistakes. And the rest of the, uh, the signs, 
like he made uh, the group of women, group of natures, uh, parts of the body, eyes, okay? So this code we're going to use explaining the symbols of uh, the Gosford glyphs and to understand which symbol we could recognize from the uh, Gosford glyphs uh, is what in our uh, sign list. And this is not the only sign list we used. We used another sign list from a dictionary for uh, Vigus 2012. And the third one we used is New Gardener uh, sign list. So New you used three different sources because mm -hmm. you couldn't find all of the symbols in one source? Exactly. Fantastic. And that is not a mistake of the writings. That is because of the lake, I can call it lake of the, uh, of the information in a separate sign list. Sign lists couldn't house all the uh, letters and the symbols. That's why I used many sources and not, those are not the only sources I used. There is one of the signs I couldn't find in any sign list, but it is represented in the Egyptian temples. I found the symbol in Komombo temple. temple. And I will show you the list, uh, the sign, the, the symbol, that symbol, uh, while I'm explaining the symbols. So now you're explaining to uh, the audience that how you are identifying each and every one of the mm -hmm. symbols on the Gosford glyphs. And these texts are all from what time period? Uh, I believe according to the writings, I could recognize the writings dating back to the late Egyptian time. Now the sources uh -huh. I was asking about, like the... Uh, such sources. Yeah, because we've already established that the Gosford glyphs mm -hmm. were first discovered in the early 1900s that we're aware of, mm -hmm. that's been documented. And I'm just curious that these source books that you used, what what... How far? How, what, when are they dated? I understand. Okay, when the publics could understand or read hieroglyphics or have the uh, the uh, proper book for understanding hieroglyphics, not before 1950. Beautiful. The the studies of hieroglyphics started with uh, Jean Francois Champollion 1920, but it was for few people, for only for less than 50 people maybe or less than 100 people all over the world. But after some uh, uh, famous Egyptologists like uh, Wallace Budge, like uh, Alan Gardiner, they started to write their books, and I believe it became popular, uh, for, not for the, the normal public people, but for the educated people who are looking for this kind of information, but again, not before 1950. Wow, yeah. that says a lot right there. Mm -hmm. and, and some of the symbols in uh, Gosford when you search, uh, as Muhammad was just saying, when you search for it in the dictionaries, you don't find it. And mm -hmm. some of it only existed in the dictionaries of 2012. Yes. So this, wow. this is like the Vikos dictionary, yeah. 2012. Some of the symbols was, were only found in that one, not in Alan Gardner's old uh, Symbols and meanings also. Yeah. Well, I'm excited. Mm -hmm. Let's get started. Okay. Okay. So uh, we're, we're going to see now the uh, symbol uh, from on the right side, we can see that is the symbol we can see it in Gosford, and on the left side, this is the si the same uh, symbol from the list of the uh, sign lists like Garden. And you can see uh, I gave it, uh, or I found that the, the the symbol to the left side has the code A40. A40. That's why I gave the same code to the symbol to the right side from Gosford. And you can judge by yourself, the, is it different or the same symbol, okay? Especially after I show you more symbols. This is the second symbol, okay? Both are seated men, if we go back to the first. You can see this is the man with a beard and with a headdress, okay? The second one, similar, but there is a kind of something or a tool or uh, like a, like a scepter uh, above his knee and we can see the perfect details existed on the uh, sign list by Gardner and this one has the code A42. Does each code have a different meaning? The code is not giving a different meaning it means different picture. Different uh, style Signature, of different the style. Same yes glyph. exactly uh -huh. Thank you. but then the symbol itself gives a different meaning but 
uh, the symbol doesn't have one meaning all the time. According to the rest of the world, the symbol can represent, uh, like this, uh, uh, as an example, this picture, it means ships. It can represent uh, richness, okay? But in another uh, different word, it can mean another uh, meaning. So it's not the same meaning all the time, okay? okay. So you can see that the, the symbols from Gosford are matching or is the same with our uh, Egyptian symbols. And also there are other pictures we can see. You must understand that the ancient Egyptians depend on their uh, letters. Uh, they used the, uh, the symbols from nature, from the environment around them. They used human shape, they used eyes, heads, legs, hands, and different types of, of hands, arms, fingers, okay? So that is what we call it hieroglyphics. Even the, uh, the wildlife, wild life, they use the, the lion, lioness, cats, dogs, uh, elephants, hippos, giraffes, trees, different types of uh, trees, boats. So some symbols have phonetic, or some symbols mm -hmm. actually uh, refer to like a letter and mm -hmm. some actually to like a uh, form mm -hmm. of thought or... Yes, we're going to come to this. Some okay. of the symbols are representing the uh, individual letter and other symbols are representing a word, okay? This is one of the interesting signs. This is the back side of the, uh, the line, the hip and the tail of the line. And you can see it is the same in the Egyptian sign list. This is our famous word, Nefer. So many people who uh, love Nefertiti or Nefertari, they must understand that this is the origin of the name Nefer. And this is the answer of your question. It is one symbol but we can read it as read it as three letters, Nefer, N-F-R. Right. And Nefer in this case means beautiful. It has other meanings, but the famous meaning is beautiful. But in this uh, text, we will find and discover together that the word Nefer has a different meaning than beautiful. I've heard it could also be resonant uh, tone or... Mm -hmm. It uh, means harmony, harmony also, yes. yes. It means... Uh, yeah. but. Mm -hmm it will have different meaning as we're going to explain. Yeah. As you said that uh, not all the symbols were uh, understood and even if the ones uh, even the ones we understand they could have different meanings. Exactly. That's what I wanted to point out. There is something I use as, a, as an evidence because some people will ask me, okay, when you, when you asked me the question about do you think it is authentic or no? I said definitely yes. Okay. So I'm going to show you now some evidences I found that uh, why I used three sources, uh, three different sources for the codes and for uh, identifying the symbols. Because some of the symbols were represented with what we can call it the famous shape the, or the usual shape used by the ancient Egyptian scribes and writers. Okay, but. There are other kind or different shapes were represented, but maybe not in a large scale like the, the other famous ones. Okay, so the one who wrote the uh, the Ghost for the Cliffs used some of those, if we can call it, some of those rare examples for those symbols, not common uh, ex uh, symbols, not the, the the famous ones we see it in our temples or in our tombs, but he used kind of rare. Uh, shapes which has existed also in our tombs and uh, temples but not in uh, the same number uh, of, of the famous ones but to be honest uh, that uh, or to, to explain better that we found those rare uh, symbols listed on those uh, sign lists like if we go to Alan Gardiner sign list we will not find those symbols okay like this symbol we call it F 37a here is this is the difference if we go to uh, f37 we will find 
different shape okay so this is the the picture of the symbol we call it f37 it represents the backbone of the egyptian body and uh, maybe a piece of flesh in the end and four ribs from the ribs okay so if we go back to our symbol it represents something similar like this okay so uh, how could we make our judgment that this is the same symbol or no okay according to another sign list so we can find the same symbol is listed and not only the same but with uh, its variation as you can see we have f 37 a d e j b and f and when they include all of these variations they're saying that these have actually all been found in scripts written somewhere right yes of course we they they don't uh, imagine or try to enhance the symbol by themselves that is was found definitely found in uh, at least one place but i believe it was found in many places but not popular mm -hmm. like karnak temple Luxor temple the tombs of valley of the kings those are the famous sources we use to uh, find the symbols okay but don't forget that we have thousands of papyrus thousands of broken pieces of uh, stones and they all have letters some what we call it rare symbols like this okay the thing here that when somebody uses rare symbols that uh, some of the experts in, in the hieroglyphs wouldn't know about it 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Have only recently found. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. It only mm -hmm. exists today, like in the 2012 dictionaries, after more research, but like in uh, Gardner's list, it's not there, as Muhammad was just shown. It is not listed, yes. That's why he, he, he felt its um, uh, authenticity. Mm -hmm. because this cannot be copied mm -hmm. exactly. because 50 years ago there was no writings that contained nobody studied it mm -hmm. 50 years ago so you Not had to have a working ago. knowledge of the language of hieroglyphs mm -hmm. in order to understand or even know about some of these rare symbols true yeah. and and not only uh, we cannot say uh, they are they know hieroglyphic this type of writings need something I can call it over or beyond ordinary knowledge of hieroglyphics. Ordinary knowledge will lead you to the famous symbol. Like if we look to the screen now, we're going to see this symbol, F46. F46, the famous one. Why I call it the famous? Because I made this research. But before I made this research, I call it this symbol, not this famous symbol. Now I understand that there, there is another symbol, similar but maybe taking different direction. Or at least there are some changes a little bit. But before doing this research, I used to understand that F46 is this symbol on the right side only. Okay. But after I made the research and after I uh, looked in many uh, sources, I found that there is another symbol called for, uh, F46A. It is the, um, the opposite uh, of the, the mirror picture of 40 F46, okay? So if we are talking about someone who uh, knows hieroglyphic and didn't know that there is something like this existed, and this is not uh, a mistake because all of us are reaching certain levels of education and knowledge according to our readings and researches, okay? So it means that the one who wrote the gospel glyphs, he understood this very easy. It was very easy for him to understand the, the famous uh, or the, the regular uh, representation of this symbol and maybe the public, the, uh, the public representation of the same letter. Okay? So this is another evidence. If someone who had the knowledge of hieroglyphics is going to write this, he will use the uh, famous symbol F46. Okay, there is no need to use F46. Also, some will say 
some letters, uh, uh, some who knows hieroglyphic, okay? Some people who know hieroglyphic will say some letters are facing different direction from the usual direction. If, because we understand that if we see a text from hieroglyphics and the letters facing right side, all the other letters must face the right side. And uh, I explained before that the Egyptian used the, uh, the symbols from the, the environment and it had faces and it has uh, like front sides, back sides, it can show right or left, okay, facing right or facing left. So in this picture we can see th this snake is facing right side, but the original uh, one in, in the list, okay, in the list, facing left, but when you go to the Egyptian tombs and temples, you will find both are represented. One sometimes to the left and one other times to the right side. So that is not a law uh, we, we force on the writings. Now this, this is our imagination about the writings. But the actual writings facing the, the both sides. Okay, So that is not a mistake. That is different type of writing. So you're saying that those that call it a hoax are saying mm -hmm. that it's because uh, they believe it's a hoax because the writings are going yeah. in different directions and mm -hmm. you're addressing that that was mm -hmm. normal and did happen. Mm -hmm. Look, I will not say normal, but I will say our point of view is against this. But who said our point of view is always right? And as I explained before that so many letters are not existed in the sign lists and existed in the tombs. Mm -hmm. And uh, other directions of letters existed in the walls uh, of the temples and tombs and not existed in the temples. So you're saying you've seen this occur in many different exactly. places. Uh -huh. That's yes. what I want to establish. Mm -hmm. That this isn't a rare thing, that you have seen mm -hmm. this before. Mm -hmm. We have seen so we can't going cite against this. each other. Yes. Actually, mm -hmm. Muhammad pointed it out when we were visiting also the tomb of T. Yes. There are writings going against each other, exactly. and there is another tomb that has some writings going against each other behind the pyramid of Titi, and they all goes back to the old kingdom. But about the, the people who think that Gosford glyphs is a hoax, I have um, uh, like found out that most of the people who uh, share this, they share it from one single article, or like he made four uh, parts of this article, but it's the same man. He doesn't even represent all his name, and I don't know why. And uh, in his opinion, that these glyphs are not representing, are not spelling any words except for the ones that spelling the names of Khufu and the one beside it. Maybe you guys have already proved that not to be the case. <laughs> yes. Okay. Let me show you this picture. This is. A letter we uh, or a symbol we found in the Gosford glyphs. Okay. So it shows as a, a combination between two letters, H or H and R. If you search in the three sign lists I mentioned, you will not find this symbol. Okay. So easily I can say this is a mistake or this is something wrong. Okay, because I can't find this in the lists and where I do my studies from where from the lists from those from the, uh, from the, from the books yeah. okay uh, and books we all respect and we uh, appreciate what they did okay so immediately I will say this is not right this is because this is not uh, found uh, in the uh, in those sources so this is a, a mistake but what about this picture this picture from the back side of the, uh, of the temple of Komombo. And uh, if you have the chance to come with me and come with us in a trip visiting the temple, I will show you the symbol by your own eyes. We can see the symbol is represented here in the temple. Can you see it? Yes. And I made the red right arrow. That note. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And to be generous with you, I will read the, that line for you to understand the meaning of that letter. This letter originally means another word or, or, the or a different symbol called Hena. Hena means with or and. But during the Greek time or the late Egyptian time, 
the, the letter took different shape, or the symbol took different shape, shape and became this shape. So it's saying, it says Tifnut, Netter Tifnut, with her, with her uh, brother Shu in the city. And they mean in the city, they are talking about Komombo, Satin. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is the name of the ancient name of the city. So we understand that, so we are not only found the, the symbol, but also because of the rest of the uh, writings, we can understand the meaning of this symbol. Okay? Also helps you to date the site, apparently. Exactly. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes.